Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. As you're taking your seats, please turn with me to Haggai chapter 1 and verse 12. We're going to be doing verses 12 through 15 this morning. Uh, I had a dream last night. I know. Actually, it was. It was a frightening dream. Uh, and I'm not making this up. Uh, last night, I had a dream, and, uh, and it actually, actually it ha- happened three times, so it must mean something. But um, in my dream, I, I had driven home to College Station. College Station's about three and a half hours south of here. I'm driven home to College Station, but the conference wasn't over yet. And I was sitting at my kitchen table with my, my family, and I looked down at my watch, and it was, it was 11.15, and I realized that chapel was starting and I wasn't there. And I woke up in a panic, went back to sleep. I had the same dream. <laughs> woke up and I was scared again. And it happened a third time. And I woke up again and I said, well, I better just stay awake now. And I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm just glad to be here. So. <laughs> I, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad chapel didn't start without me. Um, we're going to read beginning in verse 12, chapter 1 of Haggai. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would stir up our spirits. Father, I pray that we would have hearts that are willing to listen and to obey. Father, we confess that so often we avoid your word or we look into your word and our hearts are resistant. But instead, I pray, Father, today that you'd speak to us. We'd hear your voice and we would respond with courage and obedience. Father, I pray that your spirit would work powerfully this morning. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. I want to uh, remind you of the setting. Remember, the people have been removed from the land because they've had disregard for the holiness of God. They've had disregard for his law, and so they have gone and followed the peoples of the land to the high places, and they've committed idolatry. And so God has taken the nation of Israel. He's removed them from the land, and they're in captivity At the end of their captivity, God does a miraculous thing. He stirs up the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, a pagan king. And Cyrus commissions God's people to go back into his land and to rebuild his temple. A group returns, a very small group, actually, but an incredibly courageous group. They leave Babylon and they're going back to a land that most of them have never seen before. They're leaving behind sometimes family and friends. They may be leaving behind businesses and wealth And they're going to a land that they know is depressed and downtrodden and there may be nothing left there. But they go back anyway. And when they get there, they rejoice and they reestablish the altar. They set up the altar to God and they begin making sacrifices to the Lord their God. And they're enthusiastic. They lay the foundation of the temple and some are cheering and rejoicing and some are sad and weeping. The few that saw the temple in its former days and the rest of the hearts of the people gradually become discouraged and there are attacks, and there's, the enemy is stepping in, and they're, they're, they're physically attacked, they're emotionally attacked, they're psychologically attacked, and they stop building the temple of the Lord. For 16 years, nothing is happening. And then God sends the prophet Haggai, and there's revival. This is a biblical example of revival. God, in a sense, makes them alive again. In a matter of literally just hours and days, their value system changes, and they turn away from pursuing their own paneled houses, their own comfort, their own agenda for their lives, and they turn back toward God's agenda. 
There is revival stirred up in the land. Wouldn't you love to see that? <laughs> Wouldn't you love to see that? Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's better. Okay. All right. Thought, man, I'm not connecting here. All right. I would love to see that. I'd love to see that frequently in my own life. I'd certainly love to see that uh, in my church. I'd love to see that in the United States. I'd love to see that in the world. I pray for that. John Piper wrote a great book called Let the Nations Be Glad. He said, when the glory of God himself saturates our preaching and teaching and conversation and writings, and when he predominates above our talk of methods and strategies, psychological buzzwords and cultural trends, then the people might begin to feel that he is the central reality of their lives and that the spread of his glory is more important than all of their possessions and all of their plans. And then revival will occur. What does it take? I want us to look back again, chapter one and verse 12. The prerequisites for spiritual revival. Verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. The first prerequisite is the proclamation of truth. The people of God recognized that God was speaking. This wasn't Haggai's idea. These weren't Haggai's words. God was speaking. This is the voice of the Lord coming through a human messenger. This is a repeated theme throughout the book of Haggai. Look at chapter one, verse two. It says, thus says the Lord. Verse three, the word of the Lord. Verse five, thus says the Lord of hosts. Verse seven, thus says the Lord of hosts. Verse 12, it's the voice of the Lord. Verse 13, Haggai spoke by the commission of the Lord. This is the voice of the Lord. And the people recognize God is speaking to us. God is speaking. Men and women, the reason that I chose Dallas Theological Seminary is because the whole curriculum is founded on the word of God. That's why I came here. I didn't come here for the location. <laughs> I didn't come for the weather. I didn't come for the scenery. And I could have gone other places. But I came here because the word of God is honored. The word of God is trusted. They believe that the word of God is powerful and that it's active and that it can change people's lives. You men and women are going to be the spokesmen for God, the messengers for God in the next generation. Do you trust the word of God that it's powerful? Stand behind the word of God that it actually changes lives? You need to know the word of God. That's the foundation. There's a beautiful description of your role, the role of a, a priest. Malachi chapter two, it says, true instruction was in his mouth and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. He doesn't speak his own word. He speaks the word of God. She speaks the word of God. As they stand as priests in between the gap of a holy God and an unrighteous people, and they're delivering the word of God, the first prerequisite to revival is the word of God. It's powerful. It's powerful. Another great example of revival in the Bible is uh, the book of Jonah. Uh, in case you don't remember the story of Jonah, God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. And Jonah says, no. Lord, and we talked about that a couple days ago. That doesn't work ever, right? <laughs> no, Lord. God just hounds him. God comes after him. I, I've, I've seen that in my own life. Fortunately, I've never had to be swallowed by a fish to get the point. But God is unrelenting if you are moving a different direction. Jonah, I told you to go to Nineveh. Instead, you're traveling the opposite direction. You are moving away from the Lord. God's gonna come after you. If your value system is not in line with the Lord's value system, God's going to come after you. And God comes after Jonah. He's swallowed by a whale. Jonah repents when he is in the belly of the whale. And God comes to him again. I want us to turn back just a few books. Let's turn a few pages back to Jonah chapter three. 
Jonah chapter three, verse one. So now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now there had to be a little bit more to the message you look down in verse seven, this is the king of Nineveh speaking. It says, he issued a proclamation in it. He said, in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way, from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. I want you to notice verse nine again. The king of Nineveh says, who knows? Who knows? Maybe God will change his mind. The king of Nineveh doesn't know because Jonah didn't tell him. (laughs) When Jonah came and preached, Jonah didn't offer any hope. Jonah didn't love his audience. Jonah hated his audience. Jonah had no compassion on his audience. These people repent, but it is not because of the speaker It is not because of his eloquence or his message because he's essentially walking through their town and saying, get your affairs in order because in 40 days you're dead. God's gonna kill you. And I hope he does. I hope he, I just hope he wipes you out. Jonah has no compassion. He is hopeful that God will kill them. (laughs) Okay? Uh, And yet they repent. Why? Why? Jonah is not given to us as an illustration of methodology in ministry, right? (laughs) Jonah is given to us as an illustration of the sheer power of the word of God to penetrate hearts and bring conviction and repentance and revival. God's word is that powerful. It's not an illustration of methodology. And I am not encouraging you to be intentionally irrelevant to the culture to which God sends you. But I do have a concern that uh, the church, at least in America where I see it, is very consumed with decoding the culture. We do a lot of study of the culture. We are obsessed with understanding the culture. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it has led to a distraction from the fact that what changes people's lives is the sheer power of the word of God. You can have all of the greatest methodologies, which I think you should. I mean, I think that you should be able to know how to send the gospel in 100 characters in a text message. And you should be able to put the gospel in a comic on a video and post it on YouTube. And we should master all of these methods, but we should never be so foolish as to think that our great methods change people's lives because they absolutely do not. The word of God is living and active and powerful. It's like a sword, it pierces, it's amazing. In Jeremiah, the Lord says, is not my word like fire and like a hammer which shatters the rock? He says, man, that's what my word is like. Don't spend all of your time mastering Final Cut so you can create a beautiful video and you don't know the message. It is the message that changes lives. Martin Luther said when he was reflecting on what had happened in the Reformation, he said, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. (laughs) And when I slept, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor inflicted such damage upon it. I did nothing. The word did it all. Now, did Martin understand methodology? Absolutely, because he translated the word from Greek and Hebrew into German. Okay, he got it into the language of the people so they could understand it for themselves directly. But he acknowledged that that's not what changed people. It was the word itself. It was the word. Uh, I interviewed for a job before I took the college ministry position at, at Grace in, in College Station. I'm, I'm interviewed for a, another college ministry position. And it was a, a phone interview. And in the phone interview, this group of leaders from this church, they asked me, they said, 
um, they had a, a college in their town and they said, Brian, if you came here, how would you make the word of God relevant? And, and I just stopped for me. I said, well, man, I don't know. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I really, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I think the word of God is relevant inherently. And, and I, I need to understand the culture and I need to understand what are the needs and I need to know these people so well that I know what they're struggling with and going through and I love them, but it's not my job to make the word of God relevant. The word of God is relevant. If you wanna understand the culture around you, I would encourage you to start by going back to Genesis one through three. You wanna understand what, who are people and how are they made and why are they struggling and what's going on? Start with Genesis one through three and then move from there. Because I think it's much more intuitive to understand and decode the culture than to really get the message right. Okay, let's get the message right. The word of God is powerful. That is the first prerequisite to revival. God's word is acknowledged in its power and it is proclaimed. Second, look back in Haggai with me again. Verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Uh, literally, the people feared before the face of the Lord. There was, there was fear of God. Again, keep your place here in Haggai and turn back with me to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 18. Exodus chapter 20, God has just given to the people the Ten Commandments. He's just given it to Moses, and Moses has come down and he's delivered it. Verse 18, it says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Do you see the paradox in Exodus 20, 20? I think this is 2020 20 vision. This is perfect vision. This is the fear of the Lord. Moses says, don't be afraid of God. God has, has come down so that you would fear him. <laughs> what he's saying is, it's right for you to see this mountain with smoke and fire and to hear the trumpets and to tremble and to fall on your face because God is powerful and he is holy and he's very different from you. But don't let that repel you. Let that draw you to him. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you come on your knees, but you come boldly. Not because you're worthy, not because you've cleaned up your life, not because you're now in seminary and you've taken that next step of spirituality. Not because you know Greek or Hebrew. You come because of the blood of Jesus Christ. For all eternity, you will come into the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll never be worthy on our own. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we'll come in fear and awe and reverence at the holiness of God and the sacrifice of Christ. But we'll come boldly. We'll be drawn to him. That's perfect vision. What happens for these people in Haggai is that they experience conviction. They once again have their, their vision cleared and they see God as he is and then they see themselves as they are. That's conviction. That's what conviction is. That's the definition. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, it says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge even the thoughts and the intentions of the heart that's conviction. That's what the word of God does. It comes in and it just slices all the way down into the deepest parts of who you are, the things that you've hidden even from yourself. All of a sudden your vision's clear. You see God as he is. You see yourself as you are. And I will tell you, uh, I resist that. <laughs> my, my flesh resists that. Because if there's conviction, genuine conviction, that means that I've got to, I've got to change and change is painful. C.S. Lewis once wrote, we're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. 
Uh, when I began preaching, I, I, had, uh, I had some fear. One of, uh, several fears. One of my fears was um, uh, being boring. <laughs> I still, I'm still afraid of that sometimes. You know, I'm preparing, I'm like, gosh, it's gonna be boring. I, I fear that sometimes. Uh, I also had another fear that I would run out of material. You know, <laughs> it gave me this much time and then, gosh, man, you know, you end 20 minutes early. I, I feared I'd run out of material. Um, I don't fear that any longer. I could go. And, uh, and you don't realize it, but I'm, I'm cutting stuff as I'm all the time, just cutting, cutting, cutting. I don't, I don't fear that any longer. But one of the, the fears that has really come upon me more and more is that I'll get to the end of my life and I'll realize that I spoke lots of words, but it was never God speaking through me. It was never God speaking through me. And people didn't, didn't hear when I stood up, they didn't hear God's voice. It'd be wonderful if you walked out of here and you couldn't remember my name at all. Some guy said something, but you know, what I, what I heard was this. I heard God speak. I have this fear that you won't hear the voice of God this morning or that your hearts will not be receptive to the word of God. That's what I fear. That's what I've been praying for. Students, whenever God's word is preached, God's intention is that it would bring change in your life. That's the point of the preaching of the word of God. God's lifted up. His name is exalted. We see him as he is. And as a result, we see ourselves as we are and change happens. Students, the reason that God in his sovereignty allowed you to be sitting in chapel today was so that God could change something in your life. He wants to bring conviction about something. May I be so bold as to say as well, and I'm, this is one of those things you say, maybe you don't get invited back even kind of thing, okay? Chaplain Bill, Dr. Pocock, there's something in your lives today that God wants to point out and change. Professors, staff, the reason that you're here is so that God could speak to you about something and change something in your life to create some sense of more life coming back. Jesus Christ wants to form his image in you more and more and more. And you know, he is never content. I don't care how long you have walked with the Lord or how old you are, God's purpose for having you here and you're getting to hear the word of God preached is so that your life would be changed in some form or fashion. I don't know what that is, but I think Haggai gives you a little image of what that might look like in your life. Okay, turn back with me again, Haggai chapter one, and let's look at it a little more closely. What does revival look like? Chapter one, in verse 14. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. First thing that is characteristic of genuine revival is that there is specific conviction and then there is specific action taken. There's specific conviction for these people. You people are more concerned about your comfort and your paneled houses than you are about the fact that I am not being worshiped in Israel. And if I'm not being worshiped in Israel, then my worship is not going out to the nations and you don't care. You have no sense of urgency about it. You're letting my house lie desolate and you're running to finish your own houses. That is specific conviction. And what do the people do? Oh man, they receive it. They don't push back. They say, yes, God, you're right. And what do they do? They get up and start to build. Okay, specific conviction brings specific action. You know the voice of the spirit in your life when you're hearing specific conviction. You know the voice of the adversary in your life when you are feeling a blanket sense of guilt because that's how the adversary works. He's the accuser of the brother night and day. Right now, right now, do you realize that? Right now, the accuser is trying to bring accusations against you to the father. He's standing there and he's bringing accusations night after night, day after day, constantly hurling them at you. And what he's trying to do is get you to have this sense of guilt. You're not worthy. You're not worthy 
to be studying here. You're not worthy to go on and serve the Lord. You're not worthy, you're not worthy. And that sense of guilt and shame comes on you. You It's bringing back this memory of this or that, this thing you did wrong, this place where you went astray. And this this sense of, of futility and discouragement comes upon you. That is the voice of the adversary because it's forgiven in Jesus Christ. And you forget the things that lie behind because you've confessed them, you've been convicted and you move on. You know that's the voice of the adversary, bringing this blanket sense of guilt, accusing you. That's not the voice of the spirit. The spirit comes and he says specifically, chaplain, I'm pointing out this in your life. I'm pointing out this. So I want you to respond this way. Specific conviction, specific change. Notice the people act on this immediately. Verse 15, it says, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king, that is uh, literally 23 days later from the very first sermon, 23 days later, probably because they had to get in this meager harvest. They got in the meager harvest and immediately they started working on the house of the Lord. Specific conviction, specific change. If you look at revivals historically, what you see is uh, you see a change in value system. In 23 days, literally just, just days, their value system changes. They're, they're, they're no, no longer so self-absorbed with their own comfort. Now they really wanna spend their time and their money and their energy seeing that God is worshiped. The value systems change and they change quickly sometimes. There is increased boldness in speaking out for God. These people, they're still in danger from other inhabitants in the land, but they build anyway. Attacks may come, but they're gonna build anyway. There's boldness. For believers in Jesus Christ, there's renewed boldness in sharing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's a characteristic of genuine revival. There is a renewed interest and activity in prayer, a holy waste of time on our knees, doing nothing but speaking into the air, but believing that God acts and responds to prayer, there's change. A few years ago, the chairman of our elder board, he came to one of our meetings and we started the meeting and he said, you know, I've been, I've been uh, thinking and praying and reading the word and, and you know, I, I just realized again that the apostles and the elders of the early church, they spent a lot of time in prayer. That was one of their primary activities. And he said to the elders and the pastors, he said, we don't pray enough, so now we're gonna start praying more. And we did. I'll tell you, this man's one of my heroes. That takes a lot of courage to say essentially, we weren't doing it right before. And to say that in front of another a group of your, your peers, fellow leaders, say we weren't doing it right before. We need to change because I feel convicted and we began to pray and we began to pray more because it, it was that we would, we would start an elders meeting and we'd open it in prayer, prayer is done. And then, man, we get to the business because God needs us to get busy, <laughs> right? And instead, we reserved the first part of the meeting for prayer and we committed that we wouldn't be rushed. Any and all prayer requests for the church personally, for your children, for any activity, all the requests are laid out. We're not in a rush. Is, are there more? Okay, when we're done taking them, then we're gonna pray for them. We're gonna pray until we're done. And then there's some time left over and then we'll take care of the business that we need to take care of. And it changed the culture of that meeting. It changed us. And that is the second characteristic of genuine revival, there is a reliance upon the supernatural. Prayer is a reflection of our reliance on the supernatural. This project didn't begin because Haggai had a good idea or Zerubbabel had a good idea. It didn't begin because they had a great planning retreat and they called in a temple consultant to reconstruct. And that's not why it happened. It happened because God initiated it And God was moving in a supernatural way and the people were acknowledging that God was speaking and they were listening to the voice of God. And so it was a supernatural thing. Revival is a supernatural thing. I wanna read you a quote from J. Oswald Sanders. He said, in our day, the greatest lack in the life of the individual Christian and of the church is the fire of God. The manifested presence and mighty working of the Holy Spirit. There is little about us that cannot be explained on the level of the natural. Ouch. 
Our lives are not fire-touched. There is no holy blaze in our churches to which people are irresistibly drawn as a moth to the flame. That's the fear of the Lord. It is the absence of the fire of God which accounts for the insignificant impact the church is making on a lost world. It never had better organization, a more scholarly ministry, greater resources of men and means, more skillful techniques, and yet never did it make a smaller contribution to solving the problems of a distraught world. Our prayer should be, Lord, send the fire. What else can meet the need of the hour? That's a message we need to hear. I think that I've seen a little revival. I think I've seen it before. When I was a student at Texas A&M, my freshman year, there were a couple students who were older than me, just a few years older than me, and one of them took the perspectives course. He found out about it. He went out to California. He took the course. It changed his value system. In a matter of weeks, his value system changed. He became uh, accredited to bring the course back. He brought it back to College Station and he brought in speakers and he managed it as a student and other students began taking it and, and there began to be this, this holy blaze. It started. And um, it, was, it was the folks who were just a few years before me. It, it influenced my generation, but it really hit these folks who were just a few years before me. It changed their boldness in prayer. The guy who, who started this, one, one day uh, he, he drug me to the local mosque to pray. The local mosque, was, it was an apartment at the time. They have a big building now. It was a little apartment and we sat in the back and we met all of the Muslims and then we sat and we prayed. That was weird, that was spooky. This man, uh, he prayed, he influenced his roommates and they began to pray and they had boldness in sharing their faith and it began to spread. And uh, now our, our church, we support 70 uh, full-time, long-term missionary families. There, there are a lot of short-term folks because we have college students coming through, but there are 70 families. And every time that, that we have a missions conference and they begin to put the faces up of these people that we support, it is stunning to me how many of them came from that generation right before me. It was, it was a revival. When revival happens, our value system changes and we are so much less concerned about ourselves and our own comfort and we become so concerned with the glory of God going out to the nations that it changes our behavior. Okay, that's supernatural. Third, it begins personally. Look at me again, chapter one, verse 14. It says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, God began with two men. He began with just these, these two men. That's where it started. It started very, very personally. Then from these two, it, it spread to the remnant. Notice they're still called a remnant. It was a small group that had the courage to come back to the land, but it spread then to the remnant, but it began on a very a personal and an individual basis. That is how Revival begins. It begins with you. It begins with a remnant. Then it moves out. A Gypsy Smith, he was an English evangelist. He was once asked by a man, he said, well, how do, you, how do you start revival? How do you do it? This was his response. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Do you have a, a place where you can pray? And said, yeah, I do. So what I want you to do is go home, go to that place, Take a piece of chalk along, kneel down there, and with the chalk, draw a complete circle all around and pray for God to send revival on everything that's inside the circle. Stay there until he answers, and then you will have revival. Would you like to see revival? I can tell you how you could start it today. It start with you. And then it spreads. And maybe you say to yourself, we're seminary here. We, we got the spirit. We sang in lots of languages. Got the spirit. You know, historically, uh, many revivals have started on university campuses and seminaries. You should be aware of that. And uh, started on campuses and uh, universities and seminaries with just a handful, just a few folks one of them, the Haystack Revival. You need to study that. It's a beautiful picture. 
just a few students, uh, they were out in a field and they got caught in the rain. They wanted to avoid the rain and so they dove under a haystack and they began to pray. And God sent a holy fire. God sent a holy fire. And maybe you're sitting there today and you say, we're Dallas Theological Seminary. We don't need fire. You need fire. We need fire. My church needs fire. We need a fresh movement of the Holy Spirit. We need hearts that are actually willing to listen a fresh way to the Holy Spirit. This is a place where God could start it, okay? And from this place, from a, a few of you, one of you, begin to spread it. And I'm not saying set aside your study of the word of God. That's the foundation. You have to speak the word of God. But are you fire inflamed or are you consumed with your own agenda, your own idea for how your life should go, your ministry should go, or are you laying it before the Lord and saying, God, send the fire and wherever you send that fire, I will go. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's right here in Dallas. I mean, that's where I'm called to say. Maybe it's in the United States. Maybe it's anywhere else. I don't care, but God, send the fire and let me go with you. The only reason that God allows his word to be preached right now to his church is so that our lives would be changed, so that he would be worshiped, and from us as the body of Christ, his worship would go out to all of the nations. If you hear nothing else from this conference, what I want you to hear is missions is not a program of the church. Missions is the purpose of the church. That's why we're here. That's why your seminary sets aside a conference a whole week to talk about this topic because it's central to our identity. It's why we're here. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would send a fire upon us. I pray that you would send a fire upon each and every individual sitting here, that we would not fear the convicting work of your spirit, but that we would allow you to lay us open and bear. There's no creature hidden from your sight. There's nothing that is not exposed to you. I pray, Father, that we wouldn't fear that, but we would know your cleansing hand you would bring conviction of sin to each and every one of us and then there would be specific action we could take. And as a holy people, that we could go out in the power of your Holy Spirit and proclaim the excellencies of you who've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Father, I pray for these men and women. I pray for this institution that I love that you would send the fire, that you would create revival. It's in the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior. Amen.